So uh, first of all, let me welcome uh, everyone. I am uh, Annabel Gonzalez, uh, Deputy Director General uh, at the World Trade Organization. And thank you very much, much uh, for joining us today uh, to mark the 75th anniversary of the GATT, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and, uh, and Trade. I am delighted to moderate uh, today's event. A 75 uh, birthday is a momentous occasion. And what better uh, than to celebrate uh, in the presence of the WTO Director General herself, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iwala, and the world's foremost uh, authority on the history of the GATT and the WTO, Professor Doug Irvin, uh, whom I will introduce uh, in a moment. Uh, in some traditions, 75th anniversaries are diamond jubilees. And that made me think about the parallels between diamonds uh, and the GATT. And let me highlight three parallels uh, as a way of introducing our discussion. First, diamonds are remarkable in the world of physics for the way they slow and bend light. And the GATT too, cast a symbolic light on a world emerging from the darkness of the Second World War. An important driver behind the GATT negotiations was the desire to avoid a repetition of the mistakes of the 1930s. That era saw a tit-for-tat tariff race between countries that made it so much harder for the world economy to recover from the Great Depression. This experience lent urgency to, argue, to arguments for a new economic order that would prevent the mutually destructive descent into protectionism of the interwar period from ever happening again. When 20, 23 countries signed the final act of the GATT on 30 October 1947, they set the foundation for, uh, of a global trading system that would replace fragmentation and instability with greater openness and cooperation. And this far-reaching idea continues to animate the rules-based trading system to this day. Second, diamonds are commonly known as the hardest and strongest natural material on earth. The GATT too has shown remarkable strength. Though it was originally devised as a temporary agreement, the GATT weathered many storms over the decades to become a bedrock of the WTO, the only organization governing global trade with 164 members and many more working towards membership. The GATT's durability owes much to the fact that it is underpinned by simple but powerful principles like non-discrimination designed to foster open, fair, and undistorted trade. These principles are couched in a broader framework of gradualism and flexibility. Gradualism in the form of successive rounds of uh, tariff cutting negotiations, which by the mid 1990s had resulted in a decrease of industrial uh, countries tariff rates on manufactured goods to less than 4%. And flexibility in the form of exceptions that allow each country to pursue trade opening alongside its own legitimate public policy objectives including, for example, those related to environmental sustainability that were less prominent in 1947 than they are today. And third, just like a diamond, the GATT is unique in many ways. It was a remarkable response by a group of countries to a world in disarray. The GATT ushered in an era of remarkable stability and predictability in global trade relations that has underpinned a 43-fold increase in the volume of trade since 1950, with huge positive effects on development, living standards, and poverty reduction in many parts of the world. Recent work by, by our colleagues here at the Secretariat, Roberta Piermantini and uh, Jose Antonio Monteiro, alongside leading academics, Jotop and Large, has shown that on average, GATT WTO membership increases trade between members by more than 170%. The GATT not only became part of the WTO, but it also contained the seeds of new rules and disciplines that govern many aspects of modern trade relations from the agreement on customs valuation to the agreement on trade facilitation and from the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures to the agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary measures. So it is easy to take the GATT for granted. Uh, widening geopolitical risks have even led uh, some to question the validity of some of the GATT's core principles, 
and advocate for alternative approaches, if not an outright retreat from trade. But this anniversary should remind us that the GATT was an astonishing feat, a tool for international cooperation, that it is needed more uh, now more than ever in a world of multiple and overlapping crises that can only be solved through collective and coordinated action by all countries. And that's why we thought that it would be a particularly opportune moment to reflect on the origins of the global trading system, what we can do to safeguard it, and how we can improve on it so that it can respond better to the needs and realities of the 21st century. And who better place to walk us through these issues than Professor Doug Irvin. Doug is John French Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. He is the author of Clashing Over Commerce, A History of U.S. Trade Policy, and many other books and articles in professional journals. Doug is also a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. So Doug, thank you very much for being here with us today. I also see that we have a large audience from across the world and thank you very much for joining. We will have some time towards the end of the session to respond to your questions uh, and you can use the chat function to post them. To start, uh, let me now turn it over to our Director General, Dr. Ngozi okonjo Iwala, for her remarks. Dr. Ngozi, the floor is yours, please. Well, thank you, um, Annabelle. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to all of you who are joining us from uh, around the world to mark this 75th anniversary of the signing of the, of the GATT, a momentous occasion. Annabelle has really summarized it well, so let me keep it short. First, let me say how delighted I am that Professor Doug Irwin is joining us uh, today. Uh, I don't need to say much. He wrote the book on the subject, on the history of it, and we're all very much looking forward to, to, to listening to him. I can say without exaggera exaggeration that no one is uh, better to look back at the GATS origins its impact and its lessons for the present and the future of the multilateral trading system. Doug literally wrote the book on it, as Annabelle said, The Genesis of the GATT. With co-authors Petros Mavrodis and Alan Sykes, this came out in 2008 for the 60th anniversary of the GATT's entry into force. Its opening chapter provides context, not just for our discussion today, but for ongoing developments in the world of geopolitics, trade, and policy. Let me quote, to understand the origins of the GATT, one must appreciate the traumatic events of the 1920s and 1930s. The period between World War I and World War II was a political and economic disaster, scarred by the Great Depression and the rise of fascism. A strong desire to avoid repeating this experience after World War II fostered support around the world for a new approach in international economic cooperation. And close quotes. The new approach worked. The GATT steadily unwound the protectionist barriers and isolated trade blocks of the interwar pre period, creating a stable and predictable multilateral trading system. Global trade began to boom, driving prosperity and reconstruction, first in richer countries and then across a much larger share of the world population as more developing countries tapped into global trade to drive growth, structural transformation and job creation. Trade helped to lift over a billion people out of poverty, though this progress has been derailed a little bit by the pandemic and the war in, the, in Ukraine but it's incontrovertible what happened with the advent of the interlinkages of trade. This brings me to my second and final point. The GATT and the WTO were so effective that at least until recently, the open global economy was something many governments and markets took for granted, like air or water. But as I learned as a child from my daily trips to the stream in my, in my village, Water is something we cannot and should not take for granted. The same is true for the multilateral trading system. Today, we're in danger of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. 
stepping away from a shared system of rules that has served us well, instead of addressing specific and reasonable concerns about exclusion and unfairness. And this is what is happening at a moment when we need multilateral cooperation and solidarity more than ever to solve global challenges. I'm the first to say that the WTO is far from perfect and that our success at MC12 was just the start of the reforms we need to, to make. But we need to keep investing in the WTO and in the multilateral trading system. And to borrow Annabelle's metaphor, it's a jewel worth polishing. I remain convinced that we can use trade and the WTO to foster peace and address other problems we face. The circumstances around the GATS creation are perhaps more relevant today than at any time since 1947. And when I look at some of the things that, uh, that uh, Professor Erwin wrote for the 60th anniversary, I get goosebumps because they are so relevant. It's like the words have been crafted to describe the situation and the geopolitics we're in today. So I look very much forward to hearing from you, Doug, your insights on the lessons policymakers should take on where the multilateral trading system came from, where it should go from here, and maybe how we should nurture it like a baby. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Director General, for those insightful uh, uh, remarks. Uh, and with that, let me now turn it over uh, to Doug, please, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I always like celebrating birthdays, and this is certainly an occasion that should be marked because the, the GATT and the WTO are of historic significance and play such an important role in the world that we live in today and will, I think, for many, many decades to come. Uh, let me share some slides and show some pictures, and hopefully uh, you can see these. Uh, whoops, uh, hang on one moment. I think I messed something up. Uh, let me try this one more time. Okay, hope you can see these uh, slides here. Um, yeah. And wh what I'd like to do is uh, talk uh, mainly about where the GATT came from and what it did, and uh, then end up by talking a little bit about uh, where it uh, might be going in the future, and the tr certainly the, putting the, the challenges that it faces now in, in historical context. The historical context that I want to build is that uh, the GATT is part of a, a century-long uh, struggle of nations to try to come up with a well-functioning trading system. So we have to go back in time to see how this struggle has worked out, how it has played out, the forces that have shaped cooperation, the forces that have also shaped disintegration uh, to sort of understand where we are today. So actually there are four uh, trade regimes uh, in the modern period, <clears throat> the modern period being since the early 19th century that I'd like to highlight. Um, <clears throat> the first is called the 19th century treaty network. It was mainly from mid to late 19th century. Uh, I would call it an order without rules. There was no institutional basis for it, um, but a trading order system did, of, uh, did emerge. It was under uh, an exchange rate regime at the time, the gold standard. And it turns out the exchange rate regime, I think, is an important component that we sometimes neglect to think about when we're talking about the trading system. Uh, and then the question is, what uh, country is sort of the leader uh, of the system? And implicitly, the United Kingdom was at this time. Um, then I'll move on to talk about the interwar period, where <clears throat> the legal framework was being attempted to provide, be provided by the League of Nations. They were working towards rules. They had a very short period in which to do so, unfortunately, when the gold exchange standard fell apart with the Great Depression. And this is a period of uh, multiple uh, power centers around the world. Then we enter the uh, period of the GATT, the post-World War II period, period uh, when the GATT was founded up till the foundation of the WTO. We had a, a, a trade framework of flexible rules. Uh, the GATT was the institutional basis for it. We had the Bretton Woods system of fixed but adjustable exchange rates. The US played a major leadership role. But since the formation of the WTO, we're now into a, a different global era where the rules are a bit more formal. We are in a much more flexible exchange rate regime. And once again, we have multiple power centers. So this is sort of a, a one way of thinking about this struggle over time to build a, a durable and uh, lasting trade order. Now, I start uh, after the Napoleonic Wars, um, which had racked Europe in the early uh, uh, 1800s. And the, the settlement uh, was a political settlement at the Co Congress of Vienna in 1815, but it did not include trade. 
The trade order was not on the international economic agenda, but of course there was diplomatic cooperation in terms of uh, the settlement uh, of the war. Uh, the trade order begins to emerge with uh, moves by Britain to repeal its corn laws in 1846, repeal its navigation laws a little bit earlier than that. But really the first sort of institutional or treaty framework based uh, foundation of a world trading system was the Cobden Chevalier Treaty between the United Kingdom and France in 1860. Um, and here's the negotiators, here's some of the text here, which gets into the tariff reductions and the, and the rules. Um, and what happened uh, as a result of this uh, treaty uh, was that uh, other countries uh, followed, uh, followed on and wanted to sign additional treaties with France and the UK to ensure the establishment of most favored nation status. And of course, that, that's where the GATS contribution came in later. And what happened was a 19th century bilateral non-system it was all bilateral treaty networks. There was no multilateral overarching framework. It was a non-system in the sense that it wasn't a formal one, but you had this, uh, what has been called as the mother of all spaghetti bowls, um, uh, uh, the linking countries that reduced trade barriers, ensured that non-discrimination was uh, a, a dire, desired objective and something that countries want to achieve um, and get for themselves. And uh, trade uh, became this, uh, there was a momentum behind uh, this trade liberalization process. Uh, unfortunately, there were uh, some uh, uh, difficulties, uh, and some of these should resonate today. This system, this uh, non-system, began to break down in the late 1890s um, under three factors. First of all, there was a, a major financial crisis um, in Europe and the United States in the early 1890s. Um, there's a globalization backlash in the sense that the system was so successful and there's so many transportation improvements that uh, pressure was put on European farmers as a result of the influx of grain from Russia and the United States that this uh, led to a backlash in terms of agricultural protectionism. Uh, Britain began to uh, move away from unilateral free trade and overlaying all of this was the geopolitics, the rise of a, a British-German rivalry over uh, 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 military strength in Europe. All these things contributed to fraying the, the, this non-system, if you will, and it sort of fell apart. And of course, the result was World War I. After World War I, this is another time when world leaders tried to get together to construct a, a viable international trade order. Um, President Wood Woodrow Wilson in the United States, in his famous address uh, on 13, uh, 14 points, um, called for point number three being the removal as far as possible of all economic barriers and the establishment of equality of trade conditions among all nations consenting to the peace and associating with themselves with it for its maintenance. So once again, uh, this idea of equality of trade treatment, non-discrimination, uh, as well as the removal of trade barriers was very important uh, objective at the time. Now, this is exactly what the League of Nations tried to achieve in the 1920s. Um, it, the progress was very slow because of the wartime disruptions that were still uh, in the recovery process, but there's an, uh, an attempt to establish the international monetary system at Genoa in 1922. Um, Britain didn't get back on the gold standard until 1925, and it was really the World Economic Conference in 1927 when world leaders really began to sit down and talk about international trade arrangements and what they could do to assure lower trade barriers, facilitate commerce, uh, and uh, ensure non-discrimination in treatment. Um, the next one, of course, was in the midst of the Great Depression. It was not very successful, but this 1927 venture led to a lot of research and discussion about how the trade order could, could uh, work. The big problem, of course, with the interwar system, or at least the system in the 1920s, was the lack of participation by the United States. The United States, having proposed the League of Nations, decided not to join. And here's just a political cartoon. I'm fond of cartoons. They illustrate so much. Uh, illustrating that you know this bridge uh, of tying the world together was uh, uh, not being met by the United States, even though we had uh, designed the, the, the institutional architecture in the first place. So the League of Nations had a great deal of uh, difficulty in terms of um, uh, establishing a, an economic system, uh, let alone a political system that would uh, function for the world. And as a result of the uh, malfunctioning of the gold exchange standard uh, in the early 1930s, we had we entered into the Great Depression. And uh, here's a very famous uh, uh, graphic that just illustrates the uh, slide downward in terms of world trade. Uh, and with it, of course, dragging down world incomes, leading to higher unemployment um, year after successive year in the early 1930s, 1930, 31, 32, each year being worse than the, the next, the previous one in terms of uh, uh, growth in commerce uh, and things of that sort. 
Um, if you're interested more in this period, which I won't linger on too much, I do have this book called Trade Policy Disaster Lesson from the 1930s that talks exactly about the descent of the world economy into the Great Depression and the uh, problems with the trade arrangements at the time. The United States, uh, fortunately, began to step in. Um, there was a change in administration in 1933, um, and we had a new Secretary of State who very much embraced this idea of lower trade barriers, equality of trade conditions, um, not just for economic reasons, but for diplomatic reasons and for um, uh, this, uh, uh, really world peace. Um, this is uh, Secretary of State Cordell Hall, um, uh, longest serving American Secretary of State. And this is a representative quotation from him that he said he would never falter in his belief that the uh, enduring peace and welfare of nations are indissolubly connected with friendliness, fairness, and equality in the maximum practical degree of freedom in international trade. So uh, what's interesting about this statement is it's not just the, the economic benefits of trade that are important, but it's the uh, political spillover uh, benefits of binding countries together again, not just for their prosperity, but for good diplomatic relations and ensuring that at this point that uh, a, a repeat of World War I did not take place. Um, unfortunately, uh, this uh, initiative of the United States to lead to uh, some trade agreements uh, uh, started out slowly. It was once again done on a bilateral basis. There was no international consensus at the time during the Great Depression to create a multilateral architecture. And unfortunately, uh, we did enter into World War II. Um, and it's then that the United States began to reach out more to other countries, particularly Britain and others, to see what could be done to ensure that after World War II, we uh, come up with uh, suitable trade arrangements that could once again uh, prevent the repeat of yet another war and the descent of the world economy into uh, uh, depression. So this is the Atlantic Charter reached by President Franklin Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And what's interesting is the fourth point here uh, talks about, uh, with due respect to their existing obligations, uh, to countries to strive to uh, uh, enjoy trade on equal terms uh, around the world um, and for their common economic prosperity. And it was really that provision in the Atlantic Charter that is the seed, if you will, of what became the GATT. The idea that countries had to cooperate with tr on trade to ensure um, uh, not just the political benefits, but the economic benefits are shared by all. Britain took the initiative here, um, and there's a, a, an economist by the name of James Mead uh, who uh, actually wrote sort of the first memorandum, if you will, that provides sort of the text of what the gap might possibly look like. He was a remarkable individual. Uh, he uh, taught at Oxford. He uh, served at the League of Nations in the uh, late 1930s and then joined the economic section of the War Cabinet. And this proposal for an international commercial union um, really got discussions going uh, between the US and the UK and other countries as well. Um, I just add, note as a side note that he, uh, after the war, he joined the London School of Economics, wrote a very famous two volume treatise on international economic policy for which he was awarded the Nobel Memorial Economic Prize in 1977. So he was truly a distinguished scholar and a distinguished a public servant uh, who really had uh, worldwide welfare in his sights and contributed to it immensely through his drafts. Um, here's a, a plan for uh, international organization uh, in international trade. Here is his memo in 1942. And if you uh, can look at this carefully or find a copy on the web, he talks about uh, preventing discrimination. He talks about um, uh, um, the uh, economic benefits of uh, MFN, um, various exceptions that would have to be built in, um, uh, forbidding from using uh, quantitative restrictions, uh, preferences. Many, many of the points that uh, later become part of the international trading system are things that he had anticipated and talked about um, in, the, in this memo. This became the basis for discussions between the US and the UK. There's a famous 1953 Washington seminar where uh, the US and the UK exchanged views. And once again, there's differences among countries. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, agree on everything. Um, US objectives were to some extent different than the UK objectives, but there was a good faith effort to try to hammer out some sort of basis for what would uh, happen after, after the war and come up with an agreement. What's uh, particularly amazing uh, for those of you in the audience who are economists is to look at the British group in terms of some of the people here. So we have John Maynard Keynes, we have Lionel Robbins, we have uh, Dennis Robertson, uh, we have uh, James Mead. This is like an all-star cast of negotiators um, thinking about uh, the future of the world trading system. Um, 
This was for, uh, sort of put together by the United States uh, in a document that was published in uh, November of 1945, shortly after the war had ended. Uh, and it's interesting, it was presented for the consideration by the people of the world. The idea uh, that we need an international conference on trade and employment, um, uh, sort of a synthesis of what, um, uh, what uh, the US and the UK had been discussing. This was public, uh, the, the text is, doc, is, is public uh, and was made public at the time, even though the details had to be hammered out. It was a general framework for what this would look like. And just as the United States wanted um, a United Nations with all countries involved uh, in terms of political discussions, they wanted uh, an international trade conference that would include all nations and, uh, and have everyone involved in a non-discriminatory way to reduce trade barriers. But uh, th th this encountered uh, some skepticism on the part of Canada. As part of the, the marketing of this, uh, the US went to Canada and many other countries around the world and said, what do you think of this? We want feedback, we want to improve things. And Canada uh, had a very interesting idea. Um, here I'm reminded of uh, a contest that took place in the United States in the 1980s uh, from the magazine, uh, The New Republic, where they asked for what was, what's the most boring newspaper headline of all time? And the winner of that contest was Worthwhile Canadian Initiative, uh, which is a little bit vacuous and doesn't say much. Uh, but actually, this is a case where, in terms of the formation of the GATT, there was a Worthwhile Canadian Initiative that was absolutely uh, essential and critical to moving forward. And that idea was, is that, yes, we should have a, a broad-based international um, uh, a conference uh, to talk about these trade and employment issues. But... Time is late. It's 1945. We've already hammered out the Bretton Woods Agreement. We need to move forward quickly on, tr on trade. And therefore, we need a small group of countries to get together to uh, immediately agree on the text of a trade agreement that we can take to a broader agreement, broader conference on, on the international economy. So this happened in London in 1946. Um, the uh, Church House uh, uh, Conference Center, uh, right outside, right near Westminster, and there the decision was made between the U.S. and, and uh, about a dozen other countries to go for something uh, tentatively entitled the GATT, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, and then that would set the stage for an international trade organization uh, that would follow suit. Um, so uh, this is the conference right here, uh, a lot of interesting photographs from the time period of all the countries, uh, a limited number of countries here, a little over a dozen, uh, talking about uh, some of the trade arrangements that might come about. Here's the text, uh, a general agreement on tariffs and trade, which they sort of tentatively sketched out, uh, at least with some of the details. Obviously, none of the tariff cuts have negoti been negotiated yet. But of course, as we see today, uh, things are never easy. Um, sometimes when we look back at history, and we think, oh, well, there was World War II and the countries got together and, and uh, formed the GATT. It's never that easy. There's always disruptions. One of the major disruptions in the United States was uh, the Democratic Party had been very much behind this initiative, the Roosevelt and the Truman administrations. The Republican Party took over Congress in the elections, the midterm elections of uh, 1946. And the Republicans were much more suspicious of trade at this time. They threatened to stop the Geneva Conference from going forward, which was going to formalize the GATT. And there were negotiations between the uh, Truman administration, uh, Dean Acheson, the Secretary of, uh, Secretary of State, uh, and um, uh, Will uh, Clayton, who was the uh, sort of trade negotiator at the time, and congressional leaders, Eugene Milliken in the Senate and uh, Arthur Vandenberg in the House, uh, to uh, hammer out some sort of agreement to allow this to move forward. And this is really the origin of the escape clause, which later became codified in the GATT, um, allowing certain domestic industries to opt out uh, of uh, uh, the tariff concessions being made if a certain uh, procedural uh, process is followed. Um, and so there's a political reason for that. As the GATT, the Geneva Conference launching the GATT was being uh, started, um, President Truman uh, gave a, a major address on trade at Baylor University uh, in Texas. And this statement from his uh, speech, I think, is, is uh, very important in conveying what the thinking of policymakers was at the time. So uh, I know you can see it on the slide, but he said, much of the world is concentrating its thought and energy on attaining the objectives of peace and freedom. So notice it's not economic uh, uh, you know, enrichment or what have you, it's peace and freedom. These objectives are bound up completely with a third objective, the reestablishment of world trade. In fact, the three, peace, freedom, and world trade are inseparable. The grave lessons of the past have proved it. And this is, uh, as uh, Annabelle and others pointed out in the introduction, uh, exactly this reflection on what just occurred in the 1920s and 30s, the failure of international cooperation led not just to 
uh, uh, hardship for the world economy, but for uh, uh, negative political spillovers as well in terms of the rise of, of fascism in Europe. Once again, a political cartoon, I think, uh, shows this best. And this is just indicative of thinking at the time. This is a Herb Block cartoon from the Washington Post. Um, and what it has here is a tariff lobby in the United States shooting peas at trade freedom, which is holding up political cooperation, which is holding up world peace. And what you can this indicates is just the fragility of the way people thought in the 1940s. They'd just gone through two world wars. Nuclear weapons were now, uh, uh, you know, uh, had been used. Um, world peace is a very fragile thing. And the underpinnings of that, political cooperation, trade freedom are also under attack. And these things were uh, considered extremely important at the time to uh, move forward. Well, uh, after his speech, of course, the negotiations uh, began uh, at, at the League of Nations headquarters in Geneva um, on the GATT. Um, and once again, we can uh, see uh, pictures of the negotiators uh, hard at work. It looks a little bit smaller uh, than it does at the WTO today. Um, but uh, this is the foundation of, of, of the system that we have. Um, and once again, uh, if we look back in history, sometimes we think things went smoothly. They wrapped up the negotiations in a matter of months, not years or decades. Um, but it wasn't smooth at all. Uh, there are a lot of bumps in the road. And it was by no means certain that the negotiations would ultimately be successful. So the GATT text was actually set very early. That had been hammered out in uh, uh, church, the church uh, house conference. But um, there's a major issue with wool, um, hence the sheep here. Um, the U.S. Congress passed a, a bill um, uh, providing for uh, import quotas on uh, wool. Once again, just one or two senators could do such a thing. And the issue was whether uh, the president would veto that bill or not. And there's a very famous uh, day in which uh, the president, who didn't know which way to go on that bill, invited his secretary of agriculture and his secretary of state in to talk about uh, what he should do. He gave them each 15 minutes. And afterwards, he decided, I'm going to veto the bill. Um, it may hurt me politically, but it's very important to keep this negotiations going because had that bill passed, uh, there's a chance that Britain, Australia, and other countries will have walked out of the conference. So really, it was uh, brinksmanship. Um, but this is a year of crisis in Europe. In 1947, the Marshall Plan was being discussed, another uh, famous speech by uh, Secretary of State um, uh, uh, Marshall at the time. Britain was going through uh, economic chaos, financial chaos, with the pound sterling crisis, uh, and they dug in their heels about imperial preferences and uh, establishing MFN for all. So a lot of very hard issues had to be worked out in these uh, few free months. It did come to fruition, as we know, in October of 1947. Uh, here's the, the release uh, uh, with the, the, the GATT text, um, the early GATT symbols, and uh, that was the launch of, of the system. Um, it was a relatively, it started out relatively small, only about 23 countries were originally signatories, but it, it, it certainly uh, had, uh, uh, soon was to have a very big impact. Um, and once again, this was just a stepping stone to this uh, international trade organization, the ITO that the US had sought that would encompass all countries, not just uh, the ones marked in green that had been at the Geneva conference. And so in Havana in 1948, actually, uh, 47, sorry. Um, uh, actually, I think it was 48. Um, they, uh, there was a, a meeting to uh, come up with an internet, the a charter text of the ITO. And this uh, meeting, much larger, uh, many more uh, countries involved, um, turned out to not be successful. Uh, there, uh, many developing countries were very worried that the GATT had been skewed towards uh, opening of markets and did not allow their interests, uh, their policy space, if you will, to be uh, held out. There are many amendments that got into issues such as employment uh, and uh, investment and other much more contentious issues than just tariffs. And um, uh, specific commitments were, were challenged. And this is according to Claire Wilcox, one of the US negotiators, uh, also a professor of economics who uh, later wrote a book called The Charter on World Trade. As it happened, the text was finalized uh, in Havana. It had 106 articles. And once again, it, it went very much beyond just tariffs um, into restrictive business practices, commodity agreements, foreign investment. It was all encompassing um, quite a large document. Um, but uh, it, uh, the GATT, having already been sort of successfully launched with those tariff reductions, at least from the initial conference, um, uh, it did not receive much support in the U.S. Congress. And so the, the U.S. administration decided not to submit this to Congress for approval. Other countries were waiting for the, to see what the U.S. is going to do. And ultimately, the International Trade Organization was, uh, was not born. So we were left with the GATT. 
Um, and that was uh, the thing that uh, sort of uh, moved the system forward a bit. Initially, of course, um, and I'll call this the GATT system up until the foundation of the WTO, it was largely uh, the US, Western Europe, and Japan. It only slowly grew with time as more countries joined. It was largely limited initially to tariffs. Um, countries could choose uh, which provisions that, that they wished to opt in or out of to some extent. And to the extent there was a dispute settlement system, it tended to be more through diplomacy rather than um, uh, some sort of judicial process. I would be very much remiss if I didn't uh, mention the first director general, uh, Eric Wyndham White, who played a key role during very difficult times of keeping the institution together. Um, this is when there was, to some extent, a lack of US support coming from Congress and others, um, but he managed to keep this, uh, this institution going and not just going, but proved to be very successful. And as I'm sure everyone knows, there was a succession of uh, negotiating rounds um, that uh, gradually whittled away down uh, tariffs around the world. Um, so there are uh, some initial rounds in the 50s that added new members, uh, allowed them to uh, reduce their tariffs as well. Uh, three big rounds, the Kennedy round, the Tokyo round, and the Uruguay round in the 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s and early 90s um, put a major dent into tariffs uh, in, uh, among the participating countries. Um, if we look at what, what has happened to tariffs, you know, uh, this is based on work that Chad Bown and I have done. Um, sometimes it is thought that the, the initial starting point of tariffs was about 40%. Uh, we don't think it was quite that high, it was more in the range of 20 to 25%, but those tariffs were put on a downward uh, trajectory as a result of these successive GATT negotiations. And as a result, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, uh, uh, world trade has flourished. Um, but once again, I just wanna emphasize things were never easy. Um, and yes, tariffs were reduced, but by the 1980s, the world trading system was uh, beginning to fray for various reasons. Uh, there's a very famous article that made a big impression to me is when I was a student um, called the, uh, um, the uh, actually I can't see it on my screen here, uh, but the, the um, let's see, the crumbling institutions of world trade uh, and the world tr liberal trading system. This was once again, reflective of the view uh, in the 1970s with the rise of voluntary export restraints, um, extra uh, GATT measures to restrict trade, um, uh, pr precisely because of the rise of trade, more domestic interests were being adversely affected and uh, uh, escape clauses weren't uh, operating sufficiently to, to uh, allow those pressures to escape. And so there's a sense that the GATT is just not strong enough to withhold, uh, withstand uh, these pressures that were coming at it. There was even a famous commentator in the United States who in 1990, even after the Uruguay round had been launched, who said, um, the GATT is dead. This is Lester Throw, who was a famous professor of economics at MIT. Um, one of his colleagues at MIT, Rudiger Dornbusch, said the GATT is not dead, it's just resting. In fact, the GATT was not resting. The Uruguay round was well underway and it made tremendous progress. And it's very interesting, the timing here, because just two or three, laters, two or three years later, the Uruguay, Uruguay round was wrapped up. And of course, it was a, a, a tremendous success in terms of how much it accomplished. Um, the, the, the Uruguay round, of course, uh, uh, not just reduced trade barriers, extended trade rules to many uh, uh, new areas, but it uh, created the WTO. That's where the WTO was born in terms of this uh, wonderful building that uh, Annabelle and others have their offices in. And it's so uh, nice to visit. But the GATS, the WTO system is a little bit different than the GATT system. Um, it's a uh, much more global reach. So it, in some sense, it's, uh, it's um, uh, uh, the appearance of the international trade organization that the US had envisioned uh, uh, after World War II. It's not just tariffs, but many more disciplines uh, are involved. Uh, it's a single undertaking, and we have much more of a, a judicial, a stronger dispute settlement system in place. So this is in the system in some sense that uh, many, some countries had envisioned after World War II. It took some time to get it, but uh, it, um, it is much uh, broader in terms of its reach and scope um, uh, than um, had been the case. Let me just pause and just say, well, what has the system done for the world economy? Um, and of course, uh, tremendous benefits. So here's just sort of an index of globalization, if you will. It's just the world trade to GDP ratio. And it shows these various uh, uh, features that I've been talking about. So in the late 19th century, under that uh, bilateral non-system I talked about, there's a rise in global integration. Um, trade to GDP rose. Yes, production was rising, trade was rising even faster. In the interwar period, the 1920s and 1930s, we had this implosion in the world economy. Trade, there was a disintegration of the world economy, trade fragmentation. Uh, trade was less important in terms of 
uh, uh, total GDP. Here we have sort of this GATT system uh, where, um, uh, you know, the initial rebound after World War II, but under the late GATT and the early WTO, we saw this explosion, this period four, a, a tremendous rise in the trade to GDP share uh, around the world. Um, and, uh, and, and to some extent, the trade liberalization that the WTO has helped foster uh, has led to this, this period of rising trade, um, very rapid growth in trade that uh, Annabelle spoke about earlier. When we try to think about what, what are the impact of this, um, there are so many studies out there that talk about uh, not just the impact of the WTO and the GATT on trade, but then the impact of that higher trade on world incomes. So uh, this uh, idea that the GATT or the WTO is passe, um, sort of that uh, harking back to the uh, uh, Lester Throw notion that the GATT is dead or what have you. Study after study has, has shown that that's not the case. Here's one uh, recently in the European Economic Review uh, talking about the trade uh, expansion as a result of the, the WTO. Here, of course, is the paper referred to earlier by the DG uh, done by uh, uh, two great economists at the WTO and, and some academics talk, uh, talking about how trade has increased, uh, WTO has increased trade by 171% uh, between uh, pair countries. And so you can see this in terms of their finding, you know, this is the, the timing of joining the GATT. Here we have the initial trade levels and we just see much uh, more rapid increase in trade as a result of joining the WTO um, after than before. And it's exactly that sophisticated econometric research that sort of provides us with solid numbers about the impact of uh, the WTO on trade. What has this done for the world? Uh, well, it's not just the higher incomes, the higher incomes put a, a dent in poverty. And so I'd commend to you this uh, joint study by the World Bank and the WTO precisely on the links between trade and poverty reduction um, and uh, its, its manifold benefits. And of course, when you look at what's happened to world uh, uh, poverty uh, since the foundation of the GATT or just a little bit before the late uh, founding of the WTO in the late GATT period, tremendous dent put into world poverty. And so if we just look around the world, where were we in 1993, just before the WTO was founded? Where were we and how much the trade has, has, has uh, uh, lifted so many uh, boats around the world? It's just remarkable what's happened to global poverty between 1993 and 2013, just uh, 20 short years. Um, huge dents. Of course, there's so much more progress that has to be made, particularly in, in regions and countries that are not as globalized as others. But that is still tremendous progress. And I think the world trading system uh, deserves some credit for that. Now, where are we today and where, where are we going to go um, so I can wrap up? Um, there's a, a quote by a, a famous uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary and, and Secretary of State James Baker, um, which is uh, um, sort of tells us about the mixed blessings. Almost every achievement, he says, contains within its success the seeds of future problems. And this is why the work of uh, solidifying the world trading system is ongoing work. You solve some problems and new problems crop up. And so that, I think, is where the WTO is, is today, in some sense. It has been hugely successful, but of course, the work is not done and new problems uh, come up. So what is the success of the WTO? Is It's a comprehensive agreement um, that relies on consensus and establishes uniform rules for all. But some have said, well, that may be a little bit too far, that there's the, a trilemma, that really uh, it, it's too tight in the sense that you can have two of the of three of these th things, but you can't really have all three at the same time. That is, if you want a consensus and uniform rules, uh, it's going to be very tough to uh, have strict enforcement. You need some flexibility. If you want uniform rules and strict enforcement, well, it's going to be very hard to get a consensus that will uh, build on that. So uh, there are trade-offs to be had here in terms of how we think about the design of the world trading system uh, and what's compatible with uh, the, all of these objectives, all of which are desirable, perhaps, uh, uh, by many countries. And this reminds me, of course, of the famous Aesop's table, uh, uh, fable of the oak and the reed, and how do they respond to shocks? That is the great wind. And uh, what this says is that uh, the giant uh, tree is strong and has a sturdy uh, uh, trunk, but with a shock such as wind, it, it can break. Um, whereas the reeds are flexible and, and not very strong, but they bend with the wind. And I think this is one way of thinking about how we think about the world trading system going forward. How much structure do we want in terms of a solid trunk versus flexibility to allow countries, uh, different countries to opt to, uh, in terms of different uh, ways and things that they want to achieve. And that in some sense is the trade-offs that we're sort of facing in the successive uh, uh, ministerials that have um, uh, tried to bring the Doha around to a conclusion or move forward uh, from that failure is uh, these trade-offs among the various objectives that, that we all have.
combined with sort of the structure of the WTO and how it's very different from the GATT, is we've had a lot of shocks over the past 15 years or so that have made that challenge even more difficult. Um, so we've had tremendous uh, transportation cost innovations, but trade reforms have stalled. As a result, global value chains have sort of peaked out. Um, we had the US-China trade war. We've had the pandemic, which has uh, uh, led to think worries about uh, economic vulnerability to supply shocks. Now we've had the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which leads to concerns over food and energy supplies. There's national security concerns over semiconductors and what have you. And uh, it's um, a very challenging environment. And for that reason, I think 2000, uh, from 2008, when we had the financial crisis, we're into this uh, period that's a little bit different than the, the heyday of the liberalization of the 1980s and 90s, where um, there's an attenuation of globalization. Sometimes we hear about uh, a reversal of globalization or a deglobalization. I think those fears are, are, are exaggerated, but there's no doubt that there's an attenuation, a, a retreat to some extent in the, the degree of globalization we've seen uh, from its high levels recently. So what that means is that uh, if we thought that this liberalization was going to be sort of the end of history, as Francis Fukuyama put it, um, it's not. Um, there are challenges going forward. So a big one is, uh, since uh, what I've tried to suggest is that we can only view the trade arrangements that emerged uh, from a certain period of time as being embedded in the world politics at that, that time, the trade architecture is sort of embedded in the geopolitics of the world order. If we have a fragmentation uh, politically, uh, how is it going to be possible to hold together a, a trading system? So what are some of the lessons or what are some of the takeaways that we can get from this? Um, this sort of uh, brief excursion into a, a couple of centuries of trade policy history. I want to suggest that there are a couple of different regimes, um, depending on uh, who's providing leadership, what the exchange rate regime is, uh, and what the trade cooperation, how it manifests itself. So the world trading system is sort of embedded in a geopolitical order. So we have to worry about the, the feedback effects between the order and the trade system and the trade system and the order itself. I want to suggest to you also that um, when we look at the past and we think that things were easy, things were not easy when we look back, that every single achievement was hard fought um, and, and, and took a lot of difficult uh, negotiations. So the path is long and hard to uh, achieve a system that's uh, open and equitable to all. But I want to also suggest in terms of what we saw in the 1980s and 90s and 2000s in terms of world poverty reduction, the payoff is absolutely enormous. Um, and here's where I think that there's the danger of today is that we're in a system, we're in a, a period where global integration is extremely high level, um, and we might miss it if we were to retreat from it. Um, there's economic cost in some sense to uh, integrating in terms of disruption, but the payoff is huge. And there's gonna be an equally uh, large, if not larger uh, loss if there's economic disintegration. So a return to economic uh, nationalism and fragmentation is not just economically costly, but I think if we take geopolitics seriously, it's also very politically dangerous that uh, in the past, um, uh, uh, the two have sort of uh, uh, gone hand in hand and, and not worked out uh, so well in terms of past wars. I wanna leave you with just a quote or two. Uh, one is, um, by Jean Monnet, the uh, founder of the European Union in some sense, the intellectual uh, founder. He said, nothing is possible without individuals, but nothing lasts without institutions. So all of you who are trade negotiators, representing countries, um, cooperation is difficult, but very important with your personal participation. But it's also important to remember the institutions because the institutions create the rules and the framework that can last beyond uh, us as individuals. And it's something we wanna keep in mind. Uh, the other thought is that, um, as this FT columnist said, hearts don't beat faster for a rules-based international order. But I think as the Director General noted, um, this is something that is actually very precious and, and very important to preserve. And uh, we might miss it very much if we're allowed to disintegrate or to erode uh, because its benefits are just um, something we don't think about too directly, but are extremely important. Even if we solve all of our problems today, and of course there are so many problems, um, I'll just close with this, that in Star Wars, how, how did Star Wars the movie? Why, why was there a conflict? Well, it was a trade, trade dispute, um, taxation of trade routes. So uh, we have to get our act here together on Earth, and then we can worry about the trade wars between the planets. Um, but uh, we have our work cut out for ourselves in terms of the uh, trading system we have. And uh, I just want to congratulate everyone at the WTO for the hard work they're doing and uh, uh, on the 75th birthday of the GATT. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, uh, fantastic presentation, uh, Doug. So rich on uh, on on facts, uh, so rich on uh, reflections, and so rich on pictures uh, and uh, and uh, and caricatures, uh, which uh, which I think are are great. So um, so we now have a few minutes uh, for uh, questions and uh, and answers, uh, and we have. Uh, a number of questions already posed in our in our chat. Um, so let me maybe uh, start by one that picks up on where on where you uh, left, uh, uh, Doug, uh, which is what do you think will happen to the WTO uh, in the future? And I'm mindful that uh, you are an economic historian and not necessarily, <laughs> you know, not necessarily into predicting what the what the future is. Uh, but uh, um, but you may have some thoughts about this. So uh, so how do you see uh, the WTO evolving? Well, you're absolutely right. I like to look backwards rather than forwards. But so it's an uncomfortable act for me to look forward. Um, but I, I think uh, the director general put it very, very well, is that um, uh, the WTO is sort of the foundation of the global trade arrangements we have. Um, all countries may not uh, fully participate in it. And we've seen in the past that it, it hasn't always been inclusive of all countries, but it's sort of, I think, the bedrock of the system in terms of the ideals and the objectives of non-discrimination and uh, reducing trade barriers. Obviously, we have uh, regional trade arrangements and preferential trade arrangements that go outside of that, but they're also compatible with the framework. Um, and they're not, um, they're, they're complementary. They're not exclusive in some sense. So I think that, um, uh, it, the WTO has uh, will clearly be important uh, moving forward, um, and I think there there uh, still remains the potential for it to become the leading place where uh, negotiations take place. Be precisely because uh, even though regional arrangements may go a little bit deeper, so many of the issues are global in nature and uh, handle uh, global issues such as uh, the environment um, and things of that sort that really can't uh, be fully uh, done at a, a regional level. So I think the, the WTO has to be flexible in terms of some of the arrangements that uh, we'll be working on uh, going forward, but it's absolutely critical to uh, this increasingly, this so interdependent world that we are in today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. Actually, um, the, you know, one of the points that the Director General uh, makes all the time in, in uh, discussing the WTO is the important role of, uh, of the WTO in addressing global challenges. And uh, you mentioned uh, climate change, uh, but of course, we also have uh, pandemics and there, and there are many others. So this is, uh, I think, an, a, also a very important difference in a way that uh, from, from, from the past in the sense that uh, some of the global, some of the challenges today are are really global, and in that sense, um, cooperation among among all countries is is necessary to uh, to address them. Now we have one uh, 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 one very interesting question, several interesting questions, uh, but one uh, that uh, that I see right now um, in in our audience, and it's from uh, from one of our colleagues here at the WTO, Raul Torres, and he's asking. It's clear from the presentation that the U.S. has played a major role uh, as a driver of the multilateral trading system. Um, at the moment, uh, with the political divide in the U.S., uh, we cannot count on uh, on the U.S. to keep playing that role, he says. So he asks, do you think that uh, the system is now in a self-driving mode or can other member uh, step in? I think one of the things I wasn't able to uh, get uh, to fully um, was uh, um, the periods in which the U.S. has sort of paused its participation and other countries stepped up uh, and the role of other countries. Uh, so Canada, I just mentioned very briefly and the absolutely critical role they played early on. Um, but there's so many instances in the gap in the WTO history where it's not the U.S. or even the EU that is stepping up and playing a very important role. Um, many smaller countries come up with initiatives that are then adopted by some of the larger countries and uh, become part of the system. Um, so I think it really is is open to the ideas of so many countries that can that can get get traction. I wouldn't count the U.S. out because there have been periods in the past where the U.S. Um, leadership, in some sense, in the international system is lagged. So in the 1950s, there were some additional rounds that the GATT had uh, sponsored um, to add new members, but the U.S. was not really taking the initiative in terms of uh, driving for lower uh, tariff reductions. It really was the European, the formation of the EU, the economic, European Economic uh, Community, in the late 1950s that spurred the U.S. to another round. 
Uh, then there was another pause and then other factors changed that brought the U.S. in. So there is sort of a pause, I think, in U.S. leadership, but uh, I don't think the, the U.S., uh, uh, I think the U.S. will be back at some point. When and under what circumstances, I don't exactly know, but there has been this recurring pattern in the past of sort of lagging U.S. interest and then uh, reassertion. So late 1970s and early 1980s, when um, John Jackson, so many people were pessimistic about the gap, um, uh, the U.S. had sort of... Uh, once again, it took a little bit of time, but the U.S. reasserted itself, and the, the Uruguay round was uh, was the result. Um, so, um, uh, I guess I would leave it at that. That uh, there, there have been these pauses in the past, and the U.S. does come back. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Doug. We we also have another question uh, from uh, Mina Hassan on uh, on on your views on. Uh, the GATT WTO exception related to Article 24 and the enabling clause, uh, which basically I think it refers to, you know, how is it that uh, or has uh, re have regional trade agreements or regionalism has it uh, assisted multilateralism over over the years? Uh, so, what do you think about uh, about this uh, relationship between uh, regionalism and multilateralism, uh, Doc? Well, there's a big debate, of course, among economists and, and policy observers about whether they're complements or substitutes, as to say, do they sort of work hand in hand to some extent, or is one a substitute for the other? And uh, I think that uh, one can say that uh, there's a little element of both, but I'm confident also that uh, they are sub they are complements to some extent. So once again, uh, the formation of the European Economic Community in the 1950s spurred the Kennedy round. Um, sometimes you get uh, regional arrangements. Um, aiding the multilateral system. Um, they're providing uh, uh, templates for the negotiations, uh, uh, some uh, rules that can others can later adopt. So I don't see necessarily that the, the world's gonna fragment into uh, regional and, and preferential and bilateral arrangements. Um, I think that these can come together and, and aid the world system uh, uh, in the future. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Doug. Um, another question, and I'm uh, uh, I'm mindful that I'm taking you in all uh, directions, uh, but uh, our our audience wants to know. Um, so we have uh, one uh, one question from Adam uh, Jakobic, uh, and and basically says, if the bulk of economic activities now in services have the social economic benefits of hard won tariff liberalizations already eroded significantly. And do we need another WTO round to lower and bind services trade barriers? So a little bit, I think, a recognition uh, that, of course, the GATT uh, was originally uh, to but was basically covering trading uh, goods. Uh, then, as a result of the WTO, we have uh, the general agreement on tariff on uh, trading services. Um, but uh, still, uh, probably you know, trade costs, of course, for services are much higher uh, than uh, than for goods. So. Um, is, is there a case to be made that more needs to be done in the area of services trade at the WTO? Well, first of all, absolutely. That's a great question because um, so many countries are moving, are becoming service-based economies as uh, sort of agriculture shrinks and, and productivity has improved. Um, and services negotiations, as everyone I'm sure knows there, are extremely difficult. Every service sector is a little bit different in terms of the rules. There's no uh, ad valorem tariff at the border that can be easily just documented and, and, and cut down in a negotiation. Here, I think what's important is uh, uh, allowing foreign participation in uh, the domestic service provision. So investment measures are very important um, barriers uh, to uh, uh, foreign participation in the domestic service sector. And that's something that's a little bit can be opened up. Um, you can have sort of uh, domestic regulations regarding financial services or insurance or what have you, um, but or construction. But um, that national treatment becomes important. As long as you're allowing foreign participation in those markets through investment or other means, um, you can uh, you can um, uh, open up one service sector to the productivity improvements that are really going to be the future increases in standard of living. If we've sort of not maxed out, but we've really increased productivity in agriculture and manufacturing to the extent we want higher living standards, it's going to be in the service sector. And there's so many sectors that um, where productivity growth has not been very strong. So rather than some sort of agreement where everyone agrees on standards necessarily, um, just national treatment with foreign participation would be a big step forward. And then one can move forward from there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Doug. So we have uh, uh, two questions that I think we can combine. One is uh, from a from a great uh, thinker here at uh, at the WTO, uh, Trinisha Biswas, and uh, and he is 
uh, very uh, grateful to you uh, for for your presentation. Thinks he's fant it's fantastic. So he he would like to know what are your thoughts on the current push for friend shoring? Uh, does it carry echoes of the trade blocks of the 1930s, or is it qualitatively different? Uh, how would you respond to the critics of globalization, like Rana Porohar, who argued that economic integration among countries with different values has fostered geopolitical conflict rather than peace? And in a similar venue, uh, Josh Garcia um, also uh, asked, uh, you know, how will ally shoring or French shoring uh, that prioritize trade among democratic nations uh, impact multilateral institutions uh, like the WTO? And are these concepts incompatible with the spirit of multilateral trade cooperation? So, Okay, there, there's a lot to, to handle in that. Um, in terms of uh, friend shoring, um, it, it's uh, similar, but I think uh, much less disturbing, if you will, than uh, the trade blocks of the 1930s, which really were exclusive, cut across all commodities uh, and goods, um, and were really aimed at uh, raising barriers against uh, others and, and dividing the world into different blocks. I see friend shoring a little bit more in terms of, the, of, of national security, um, where there are certain sectors, such as semiconductors, uh, that are, are prioritized for uh, um, uh, those initiatives and not so much um, sort of exclusive trade blocks. So uh, obviously we'll have to see where, where this develops, but um, uh, I, I, in terms of the statements that have come out of the U.S. and some other countries, it tends to be in certain key areas rather than wholesale um, uh, pulling back between, say, the U.S. And, and China or what have you. Um, in terms of the, uh, some of the... Um, uh, uh, FT journalists and others who have written about globalization. It's in terms of it's very interesting. She had an article, I think, in the um, uh, New York Times on um, globalization, where there are two important points that were sort of slipped in that didn't get quite the attention. One is that there was the concession that globalization and uh, increased world trade had led to uh, a massive increase in uh, worldwide incomes. And that uh, we saw that in terms of the poverty reduction I mentioned earlier. That's a very important concession because that's not something we want to lose, even if um, she and others want uh, a more localized uh, or deglobalized world. Also pointed out in that article was um, the problems facing uh, uh, many uh, in Europe, North America, and, and around the world of increased healthcare costs, increased housing costs, um, and uh, even the cost of higher education in some countries. What's interesting is, is this goes back to your early question about services. These are these are sectors that are, have not been subjected to the forces of globalization so much. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, you know, housing policy that's that's largely national. Um, healthcare once again largely national. So um, if we're worried about sort of the backlash to globalization, and these are the problem areas that are being pointed out that people can't afford. Um, housing and healthcare, um, that, that's not really, uh, can't be really laid at the doorstep of globalization so much. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, that's a very, very strong point, I, I think. Um, so we have a, a, a number of other questions, uh, but, uh, but our time is a bit uh, uh, limited. But th there's one uh, of these questions that I would like to pose to you because it's so relevant uh, today, uh, which basically says, can you give us some insight on the use of Article 21 on national security? Uh, well, this provision, provision left purposely vague by negotiators, can the WTO dispute settlement panels be expected to adjudicate on what constitutes a measure that is justified by national security interests of a country? And does this put the WTO in a political catch-22 uh, situation? It is very difficult, and I think uh, because, once again, those provisions go back uh, quite some time uh, in, in terms of being in a different era, um, and I know a number of great uh, trade uh, lawyer scholars have, have written uh, very you know, very interesting uh, works on exactly the origin of the national security exception and how it's been interpreted over time, whether uh, countries are allowed, uh, uh, there's due deference to countries in terms of their own interpretation or what have you. This is something that I think that it could be usefully clarified by uh, uh, discussions at the WTO, the scope and the scale of the national security exception. I'd rather see it done through those discussions than through the dispute settlement system where uh, a ruling has to be made, uh, um, uh, once again, based on a fairly vague uh, language about uh, what that, those exceptions in, in include and entail. So I think there's an argument there for negotiation and diplomacy rather than um, some sort of judicial ruling uh, from the dispute settlement system about what exactly is the scope of those those exceptions. 
Mm. You know, uh, Doug, I think there's in, in precisely in relationship to, to that, but to other topics as well, there is great interest in uh, strengthening uh, one key function of the WTO, which is the deliberative uh, function, uh, which is, of course, uh, something that happens very much in our existing uh, committees with reference to, you know, particular measures uh, that a member may, may be adopting. Uh, and uh, and I, I think there is a sense that uh, in the current context, uh, this uh, the the deliberation function uh, really uh, can 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 um, play a very important role uh, in in understanding uh, some of uh, some of the challenges uh, that members may be facing, uh, but also in prom promoting uh, all greater trust uh, among members, which may eventually lead uh, to something else. Uh, but uh, but this is, I think, a, a great point that uh, uh, that you were making. So I, we're getting. I'm so, I'm so glad you made that point because, um, in terms of looking at disputes at the WTO, um, so many people have found that uh, the deliber de deliberation process beforehand can diffuse and prevent, uh, 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 you know, disputes going into the system. Uh, just understanding and discussion are, are so valuable and so important, and that's another reason why I think the WTO, in terms of its global role, is so important today. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so my my last question, I want to build on a, on, a, on a question here by Francis Odo, uh, which he, he basically wants to know about the role uh, that the WTO is playing as regards the Africa Free Trade Agreement. But I would like to rephrase it a little bit more to say, uh, what role do you see for uh, for the WTO uh, for a number of uh, developing countries that were not original founding members of the of uh, the GATT, uh, but of course many many developing countries have come into uh, into the system. So I would like to hear your views on uh, the value of uh, of the WTO and the multilateral trading system uh, for developing countries. Well, when I showed you that chart of where poverty reduction had taken place around the world, so much had taken place in Asia. Um, especially East Asia, but South Asia and Africa remain sort of uh, large pockets of, of, of where a poverty occurs in the world. Those are regions that really stand to benefit so much uh, more by, uh, by increased globalization. Um, so the Africa moving forward with um, uh, um, a free trade agreement, I think is a very important first step. Um, integration of the global system is important as well. I think a lot of that, however, has to come through uh, African and other countries themselves, sovereign governments have to make the right decisions and 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 uh, for themselves and have to uh, embrace this uh, this direction. Um, it's not something that the rest of the world can insist uh, upon for them. Cannot uh, obviously can be try to include them, but um, uh, really there has to be a domestic consensus in favor of uh, of more globalization with a strong domestic institutional architecture to to handle that. Um, so I'm very hopeful that um, there's going to be some changes in Africa that really see the benefits of globalization um, and, uh, and you know, the policymakers there with the vision to move forward in that way. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Doug. So we, we have uh, uh, still uh, some more questions, and I think we could spend here uh, all, all of the afternoon discussing uh, these issues, but, uh, but uh, you've been very generous uh, with, uh, with your time. And I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us on this uh, important occasion of celebrating the 75th uh, anniversary of, uh, of the GATT.